let's consider the simplest element possible. This is a two-noted element that can carry tension and compression along its axis. The conventional name for such an element is a rod, or civil engineers call it a pin-ended truss. In some of the codes, such as an Astran sequence, when they say rod, they also mean it can carry torsion. But I think you can figure out the generality of the element from the context. Our theory that we'll do here will concentrate on the tension compression member. I'm going to do an overview of general two-noted elements, including these other forces and moments. Then we're going to really concentrate on the tension compression member in the derivation of the stiffness by equilibrium methods and then by showing how we can assemble this body. So you can set several rods next to each other and join them. Then we will generalize the idea a bit and go back to some other simple line elements such as an electrical resistor and pipe flow and so on. We'll end up doing some problems with um, with our knowledge and show how we can assemble, how we can solve boundary value problems with the rod element. I'd like to start off by generalizing and looking at the most general case you could have for a two-noted element. Here we'd have a node A and a node B and each of those nodes could have as many as six degrees of freedom, including three translations and three rotations. The idea of the element is that it's an elastic body connecting those two nodes, and it will transmit those forces from one node to the other. The basic relation we will want will be a stiffness. It will be the force at one node generated by displacements at the other node. And we've already mentioned the example of the rod. Um, I've implied that there could be a torsional um, member involved. You can have the push-pull. And if you get into bending problems, you can have these beams and pipes and column action uh, with only two nodes. And lastly, you can have elements that are nonlinear, such as a gap element, where uh, a gap will close up and then the system becomes much stiffer. If we do specialize to the tension compression or the torsion element, then we have this situation. For instance, here is the pin-ended truss that we spoke of. And here would be an element that could handle torsion. And so you're looking at either a moment or a force that is collinear with the axis of the element. The NASTRAN series of codes have the rod element that combines those two properties. Now what's not commonly appreciated is that the two-noted element can actually be a very dangerous element. If you do allow the full generality of all six forces and displacements at each node, then you, it is possible to cause a matrix relation that is non-physical, something like a perpetual motion machine. For instance, there are elements called ELAS1 and ELAS2 in the NASTRAN series of codes where the user is allowed to define that a horizontal displacement at node 1, say, can cause a vertical, display, a vertical force at node 9. This would lead to a matrix which might be symmetric but is non-physical in that you'll get an overturning moment caused by the compression of such an element. I know that this has happened because I've done it myself in studying a transfer press and I was greatly puzzled by the fact that a, a line element like this, a um, so-called ELAS element that was being crunched between the jaws of the press tended to throw the press off its foundation and on its side. And the reason being that I didn't carefully align the nodes so that the force relation was collinear with the axis of the element. There are companies that I've heard of, uh, an aerospace company, which will take the data set for a given finite element run and then will scan it to make sure that any of these spring-like elements are properly formulated. So you can see at the outset here that there's a, some possibility to violate physical laws. 
And indeed, the real advantage of finite element methods is that normally we do build in conservation laws at the element level, and we normally do not allow such bad things to happen. So that by calling upon equilibrium, upon displacement compatibility, upon conservation of energy, normally our elements will be well behaved. But that general spring element remains the outlaw element in the library. Well, with that preamble, now we're ready to do some mathematics and actually calculate the properties of a simple rod element. And we'll concentrate on the simple tension compression element in which the forces are collinear with the element axis. We'll make this situation here where there's two nodes on the left and the right. We'll arbitrarily number those one and two. There's a cross-sectional area of this element which will be considered to have constant properties, that is materials and, and uh, cross-sectional properties constant along its length. Uh, the axis of this element is straight and the loads are going to be aligned with the axis, so our two forces are collinear. We will establish a coordinate system at the left end that will be what, what, what one would call an element coordinate system. Um, it's at the same time what you might think of as a local coordinate system and perhaps would be different than a global system describing a number of elements at the same time. Now there really are three laws that we're going to invoke here and we're a little bit short on theory at this point because we don't know the relevant energy law. However, for this simple element, because it's statically determinate, we can use equilibrium and get the full answer. Now we will revisit this problem later on after we learn virtual work and we'll redrive the stiffness matrix a different way. But for the time being, we're going to learn quite a bit, and uh, not only about the element, but how to assemble. So I'd like to get some answers going here rather early in our study to give us some intuition. Now, the three laws that we might apply now, first of all, would be an equilibrium law, Newton's second law. Now, for statics, that would mean that a body here would have to be at rest, and the forces would have to add up to be zero along the axis. Secondly, we would consider the material to be linearly elastic, and so we'd have a uniaxial version of the Hooke's law. And then thirdly, we'll take infinitesimal displacements so that the engineering strain is the rate of change of the displacement field by the x-coordinate. Now, I find that mechanical engineers have the hardest time with this third item that I've mentioned. And, um, Indeed, it is a little tricky. I'm going, to, I'm going to devote a slide to that, the next figure that we're going to see, and we'll talk more about that. But in conclusion here, with these three laws, we will be able to relate these forces and displacements at the right end with the forces and displacements at the left end and essentially replace the continuum body here in the interior with a matrix of coefficients that will provide all of the stiffness information of that entire body. I've found over the years that many mechanical engineers have very good intuition for rigid body modes, but sometimes study it so hard that then when they come to straining motion, they don't quite get it. Now, for us, strain, especially this axial strain, does have uh, some physical interpretation. It's the per unit stretching that's occurring along the axis. And the way you can find that is taking the position of an actual physical particle of metal before the deformation takes place compared with its location afterwards. Now that difference is called a displacement. And the strain has to do with the way that that displacement is changing from point to point in the body referred to the initial position or the unstressed body. This kind of infinitesimal elasticity is always referred to the undeformed body. If you ever have any worries about uh, where you're measuring from, you always consider the undeformed body as a reference. Now, 
I show in this figure a body in blue that's the undeformed body and then in red is a deformed body. I'm going to try to use red colors for things that are force-like and blue colors for things that are displacement-like in general. And so you'll notice that this displacement at the node at the left end is given in blue as the one in the right end. The interior field displacement I also have characterized with a blue arrow and I'm using this script U as a measure of the field and the upright U as a measure of the nodal displacements. Now those are intimately connected at the nodes. In other words, if you evaluate what the particle motion is um, through this script U, then as you evaluate that as you approach a node, you must recover in the limit the nodal displacement. Because after all, you're looking at particles and how they move from point to point in the interior. And as you approach a node, then you must recover the nodal displacement. So I've plotted that field displacement below, and it's a little bit uh, non-physical in that <clears throat> in that I have to plot it vertically, which is not its real direction. So you have to, th your mind has to go through a 90 degree rotation in a sense to comprehend that. Now the field displacement then would have varying values here along the domain of the problem from zero to the length L of the element. And as I've mentioned then, this vector arrow has to eventually recover the nodal value as it reaches the end. Now, it's the slope of this curve that becomes our engineering strain, epsilon x, which I call out here. And in general, that could change from point to point, but this element is called a constant strain element because when you deflect the right end and the left end, then the interior displacement field will be linear like this physically. And you can just imagine the proportional stretching that would go on over the body. But it's this strain then sometimes that is difficult for people. For us in this problem, it's a constant. One good thing that's been worked out in finite elements is a consistent sign convention. And with these two nodes in the problem, we're going to find that we use the same sign convention for both nodes, namely that it's a positive force and a positive displacement if it's to the right. So I show that in this drawing then, and I'll again mention that together these pair of displacement-like and force-like quantities always create work when you take the product. In a general case, it could be a moment and an angle, so it wouldn't always have to be a translation such as we have in any force. Um, now let's bring into play our other physical law, namely equilibrium. And in this case, the summation of forces to the right should be zero. And that just means that the force F1 at the left end and the force F2 at the right end have to balance out. Now, of course, that means one will have to be negative and the other positive. We can arbitrarily solve for the second in terms of the first to show that sign sense. Now, the strain that we are using, the du dx, can be approximated in this case by the total length change from one end to the other divided by the total length of the original line element. And that just becomes a difference in the two nodal coordinates, u2 minus u1. Now, this is fortunate because now we have related the strain in the interior to the displacements at the ends of the element. So already we're doing um, a kind of a rough form of interpolation. Let's bring in another physical law, namely the one that uh, Hooke originally proposed was that forces are proportional to displacements. Now we'll use it in the stress-strain sense shown here that stress is proportional through Young's modulus to strain. We previously, in the just derived equation, found that strain could be written as the difference of nodal displacements over the length. 
So now we have, in addition to an interpolation for strain, we now have an interpolation for stress in the body. Finally, uh, we'll use the physical uh, law for equilibrium again using two free body diagrams at the left end and at the right end. Now you don't equate stresses, but rather you equate forces on such a free body diagram. The right one is a bit easier because of the sign convention. The sign convention in mechanics is that tension is positive as an internal stress, leading to the directions of the arrows for sigma x. That is a classical mechanics sign convention, not a finite element convention, and it's a little awkward. But nevertheless, on the right side, you'll find you must have the stress times the area, which is a force to the left, equal to the force F2. And, and I say that that's a more intuitive one because there's no sign reversal. But on the left end, the same thing holds algebraically true. In this case, it's the sum of the two forces must be zero, or conversely, that the force at the left end must be minus the stress times the area, and I show that here. You may need to stop and jot down some ideas here and make sure that you understand this, because we're really quite close to our first finite element stiffness matrix. So don't be afraid to pause and do some checking on the side. We've actually progressed a long ways now. We have the interior strain field and the interior stress field both related to the nodal displacements. Then when we made the small free body diagrams at the nodes, we were able to relate that internal stress to the nodal forces. So it turns out we have enough information now. At the left end, the force had to be minus the stress times the area, and then we'll put in what we found for the stress here. At the right end, there was no sign conflict, and we found that the force at the right end also equaled the stress times the area. And if you look at these two equations, and if you start to think in matrix terms, which is a good idea, you'll notice that there are two unknowns on the left side, and if you view the displacements at the nodes as unknowns, then there are two of those on the right side, but they're linearly scrambled among these other physical parameters, A, E, and L. Better to rewrite those out in the form here and pull the variables out to the back like this, and then when you line your equations up, you begin to see that this is two equations in two unknowns, and you can furthermore group the terms on the right side into a small two by two matrix here times the unknown displacements. And so we now have a matrix law. And I think this is quite a noble goal of your work in this course, is to try to think in matrix terms rather than scalar equations. So here is our matrix law relating nodal forces to nodal displacements. And we have successfully removed the continuous nature of the body intermediate to the two nodes. In other words, all that remains are some lumped parameters, in other words, some constants that characterize the body entirely. So we can now call these a stiffness matrix K and summarize the results at the bottom. And this stiffness K is the first stiffness that you have encountered in our course. It's the first of many, and it really characterizes the geometry and the elasticity of this body. Let me rewrite that stiffness matrix to emphasize the symmetry in the problem. If I pull out the physical parameters, Ea over L, then I'm left with this matrix. This is a particularly nice form. The fact that you get the 1 and the minus 1 has to do with the static determinacy of the system, namely that the force on the one end is a negative of the other. There's another peculiarity, and that is that the determinant of this matrix is 0.
Now that's not an accident. That reflects the fact that this little element could slide along its own axis if it were free to do so. We call that a rigid body mode and it's characterized by this fact that the determinant is zero. Notice that the elastic property is tied up in the Young's modulus E and then the area and the length of the rod element are geometric properties. So the stiffness matrix captures the, the symmetry of the problem, the mechanical properties, that is the material properties, and the geometric situation. So it's quite a, um, quite a system interpretation of what would happen if you push and pull on the two nodes. Now, I want to make some comments here. The components in this matrix K are often given the subscripts I and J. Now, I stands for the row and J for the column. That's universal. And what we really have found now is not something that resists things as much as it conducts or promotes something. Now, what is it that it conducts? It conducts forces. So when you do this form of the equations that we're doing, we think of the stiffness terms as conductors of force from one node to another. And if we were doing an electrical system with the same philosophy, then what we have found are conductors. They're not resistors. And that might be a little difficult for many people, especially if you do experiments. And there's a natural reason for that. We'll talk about that in a minute. So what Kij is defined as is the force at degree of freedom i due to a unit displacement at only degree of freedom j. This is a wonderful theoretical idea, but it's rather hard to measure because in order to measure stiffnesses, you would have to restrain all of the degrees of the freedom in the problem to be zero except one. Then you would use a hydraulic jack or some other forcing mechanisms to move that one degree of freedom one unit. That would alter the forces on the others, and you'd have to readjust the other constraint mechanisms. So it's not that easy to actually measure stiffnesses. And as a result, I say here that experimentalists hate stiffness. Now, what is it that experimentalists like? Well, they like flexibility, CIJ. Now, the CIJ is actually the inverse property. And it's defined as the displacement at a degree of freedom I due to a unit force at only degree of freedom J. Now this is easy to measure because much as stepping on your bathroom scale and then watching the dial spin around, um, an experimentalist can apply a force at one point and then measure displacements at other points. In fact, at many points. And, uh, and recover the flexibilities. And I did use that approach in my master's thesis some 30, 35 years ago, where I was interested in vibrations of a delta wing, a small delta wing model, and that was quite easy to do. So uh, the two concepts of stiffness and flexibility are important concepts and, in a sense, are mirror images of each other. Once we have a stiffness for a rod element available, then we can consider what would happen if we joined several of them together. One of the first things that might bother a person is whether the coordinate system could be used in common for both of the elements, and that will turn out to be true, so the coordinates will not cause a problem. It turned out that the stiffness did not depend on the position uh, of the element, but only on its length and cross-sectional area. So we'll be lucky in that regard. Now I've seen assembly discussed by um, authors previously where a very mathematical approach is taken uh, with a lot of summation signs. And frankly, I never understood those uh, discussions. I much prefer a topological argument where you show where each of the elements is embedded in a larger matrix that's of system size. And then you can immediately see how the stiffnesses connect the nodes, how they transmit forces from one degree of freedom to another.
So we'll study assembly with two elements in question here. The one on the left, I'll draw a little skinnier, and the one on the right a little fatter, so they appear to be different. And they indeed could have different lengths and so on. In a minute, I'll assign a stiffness coefficient to the one on the left, which we will call K1, and the, that's the EA over L coefficients. And then K2, we will call E2, A2 over L2. So we'll have a characterization of the geometry and material. How can we assemble? At the outset, you have four degrees of freedom in the exploded view. Yet, if we assemble by combining the second and third degrees of freedom at the pin joint here, then we only have three surviving system degrees of freedom. So, I think this is an important thing, that we're going to reduce our number of degrees of freedom, and so there's some collapsing of information onto a more reduced space. I will ultimately use different symbols for the assembly. I'll use capital symbols for the forces um, f rather than the lowercase, so you'll be able to tell that at the end. And we'll carry a subscript E for the element displacements at the nodes, which will drop when we get to the assembly level down here. The approach will be to write out the matrices in the enlarged form for the system, which is a 3 by 3 matrix, rather than at the element level, which is 2 by 2. However, we do embed the element 2 by 2 matrix into the 3 by 3 space, so you can see where it overlaps. What I'm doing then is shown, for instance, in this left equation, where I've taken the equation for the left element with two force quantities here and two displacement quantities. I'm adding some trivial operations by adding what appears to be an unneeded third coordinate here and multiplying by zero in each case on the first two equations. Well, you can't stop me from doing that because that adds nothing to the equation for the single element. Then the third equation, which is trivial, is zero equals zero. And, um, and pads out this form. So you should be convinced that this is OK, because we showed that was true for a single element. Likewise, for the right element, we embed it into the same system matrix, including the two forces that are on the right element in the exploded view. We show the stiffness matrix again, where, as I mentioned, we're using these coefficients in a uh, lump form, calling them, in this case, K2. And we again have coordinates in the exploded view, except this one now becomes UE3. So we're almost there. Um, what we really need to do to put these two equations in a standard form is to set UE3 equal to UE2. And that means we're going to basically join the center common nodes of those two elements. That is really the assembly right there when, when we set this to be true. And when you've done that, you then find that both the displacement vector in the left equation and in the right equation have the same form. Call it Z, you know, just an abstract letter. And what we really have above, then, are two matrix equations which have a common z vector on the right-hand side. Now, you can use the laws of matrix distributivity, and we can add those quantities and handle them and manipulate them. First, we do just a straightforward addition of the left side of the equations and the right side of the equations, which gives you this. And that's really just a vector addition. So that's, that's completely legitimate. And then we'll combine those terms. We will factor out the P and Q matrices and combine them here with common outer parentheses. And then when you add
matrices, whether they're square matrices or whether they're vectors, as on the left here, you can do what's called adding term by term. And by that I mean you'll add the little component x1 up here to the little component y1. And so I've summed those two vectors together under a common set of curly braces. Likewise with the matrix here, and you don't have to adjust the common displacement vector z because uh, it's not been adjusted. Now, term by term means that you do exactly what we're showing here. And on the matrix, you have taken the stiffnesses from the separate elements and you have put them in the right positions and added them up. Neither of the uh, stiffnesses contributed to this outside term here nor to this one here. So it's interesting that there are some zeros. In other words, there are some degrees of freedom which have no force connectivity. There's no path of force, force conduction directly between the first and then the, um, the uh, far right degree of freedom. So we can add the forces likewise. We have the force at the left end, which now is a, an external force. The force at the right end is really an external force. We're not quite certain what it means to add these two forces that were external in the exploded view, but now in some sense are connected together. We know that the displacement at that point is a common displacement, and we could have given it the name either UE3 or UE2, and I've arbitrarily chosen UE2. So on the left we have some forces that are added, we have some stiffnesses that are added, and then we have the surviving degrees of freedom here. And it's the surviving degrees of freedom that are now the assembled coordinates for the system. And so that's pretty clear. This is pretty clear, but we need to think some more about what these forces are. What happens at that common interior node is so important that I'll break it out as a special small topic. And I like to call it a mental experiment. What I'd like you to think is that there's a pin that's been driven in through the two holes in the two adjacent rods and that the pin holds the two elements together. So that's the physical mechanism. Then we'll do a free body diagram for that pin. I don't want you to uh, remember this mental experiment too long, though, because when we get to problems that support moments at a joint, uh, you no longer have a round pin that acts like a pivot. In fact, most finite element uh, assemblies uh, have nodes that act like welds, or you know, it would be more like a square, uh, square pin and a square hole, and it will carry a moment. But for the moment, think of just a simple pin at that joint. Then we'll do this free body diagram. I've already been given the sign convention for F3 and F2, so I can easily just say that by Newton's third law, every force has an equal and opposite reaction, that I can draw those with the sense shown. We won't make a special sign convention for the pin, but just use the, uh, the general logic here. Then the force F, cap F here, is a possible external force now, something new that we're going to add. And if you sum forces on that pin then, say positive to the right, you'll get this equation, that the interior forces, the F2 and F3, have to add up to be this exterior force F. So I will use that fact and replace F2 and F3 in the middle position in the force vector as shown here. Now, this really is dynamite. You may not know what has just happened because it's a little subtle, but we have eliminated the internal forces in this problem in favor of the external ones. In fact, the only remaining forces of any interest in the solution here are external forces. Now, I can tell a small story that in analytical dynamics, that was one of their goals. If you've used Lagrange's equations or other energy-based equations, you realize that there was a lot of hooping and hollering to the effect that, aha, we don't have to find the forces of constraint. And that's exactly what happens here, too. In the finite element method, in the approach that we're using, which is called the displacement method,
We don't have to find the internal forces of constraint that help hold the elements together. We only worry about the externally applied forces. We've already said that we have only the uh, surviving degrees of freedom remaining here on the right, and we know how to add up our stiffnesses here, that these stiffnesses connect the same degrees of freedom that they would have in the exploded view of the body and primarily depend on the element connectivity and the way the elements are numbered and the nodes are numbered. And so we really should be able to do this assembly of the stiffness as well as interpret the forces and the displacements. Finally, let's rewrite our results for the system and use a specialized notation for the assembly. I'll use capital letters F for the forces and capital letters for the stiffnesses to remind us that these are assembled system values. And we'll still use a lowercase u for displacements, but we'll drop the subscript E, reminding us that it was an element exploded view originally. We have to have consistent numbering on these surviving degrees of freedom, so we'll renumber both the forces and the displacements from 1 to 3 rather than 1 to 4 as the original exploded view had. And then in symbol form, this will be our final equilibrium law. Now we found this entirely by equilibrium arguments as well as some geometric and material laws. If you do this process a couple times, and we'll do a little more in our problem session at the end of this lecture, you will develop intuition and suddenly it will dawn on you what this assembly process is and you'll have it for life. I don't know if it takes a half an hour or two hours. It's something like that. I'm trying to remember when I first learned. And when it dawns on you how that topological embedding works, you'll be, uh, you'll be armored with iron uh, plating. No one will ever be able to dent your armor after that because you'll understand it cold. And in fact, once you've done that and gotten that intuition, no one ever draws the exploded views again. And in fact, uh, I'm sitting here in my consulting company, uh, Automated Analysis, and out in the working rooms there are people doing assembled situations day in and day out where they envision the, the component or the structure and they put on the finite element mesh only in the assembled version. They never draw exploded views. Now there might be reasons to do sub-assemblies, but not for the finite element purpose of, uh, of doing something with those internal forces. Because once we've learned to assemble, we understand that we've suppressed the internal forces forever and we can deal only with the external cause and effect. I'm going to remind you again that the nodes are welds and not really the pin joint that we use temporarily on this simple element. So try not to remember that little um, mental experiment. Lastly, um, the rod element, which only supports tension and compression, is typical of what I call elasticity elements, one, two, and three-dimensional elasticity, such as for solid bodies. There's another class of elements that I call structural elements, and these are the plates, beams, and shells, and they carry not only forces, but also moments at the nodes. Now that we've finished our structural rod element, we can sit back for a moment and think about other comparable situations. In fact, there are some other simple elements now that we can directly write down. The one for torsion would turn out with, well, it would take 10 or 20 minutes work if we really derived it, but will turn out similarly. The torsional element also has static determinacy. It has a torsional stiffness that would be on the order of gj over l. Again, you have a material and some geometric properties, and you get this symmetric form of the stiffness matrix. Angles are the relevant displacement quantity. Moments are the relevant force-like quantity. Then we'll go into a heat conduction element. If this were a small rod carrying 
heat from one node to the other, we would have this coefficient out in front. We would have the nice symmetric relation for the heat conduction matrix. The U in this case would stand for nodal temperatures and the F for nodal fluxes. And that would be the amount of heat per unit time, perhaps watts. So you might have degrees Celsius and then watts here. Electrical problems, you could do electrical resistor problems now and connect them up in various patterns. It will turn out that the coefficient of interest would be, as I'd mentioned before, the conductance in the form we're doing it. And you'll find then that the resistor will conduct current from one node to another. Now here is the voltage at the node and then here is the current that results. Another example of a simple element is the pipe carrying fluid. And this is actually kind of an interesting case. I have worked with such a problem in small classroom situations where we would solve oh, three or four such uh, elements coupled together. Here you have the pressure head at a node, P, that will cause a certain discharge, Q. The conduction of fluid from one point in the piping network to the other will vary as one over some friction factor here. And if the flow were of molasses or some truly viscous um, fluid, then this would be a linear equation with constant coefficients. But more generally, if you look at diagrams like the Stanton diagram in hydraulics, you find that the friction effect here, or call it the conductance uh, in the reciprocal form, will vary as the velocity. For instance, as a turbulent flow develops in a pipe, if you have a really rough pipe, uh, the the pressure drop might vary as the velocity, which is the discharge here, squared. So the true pipe problem lies somewhere between a linear and a quadratic relation here. It turns out that you can actually use that nonlinear effect in the equations and you can iterate. You can guess an answer and improve it and you will get convergence, luckily, for conventional water pipe flow. So. Uh, it's turned out to be a, a doable problem, and you can see that the simple element, at least in the linear case, is similar to our rod element. It's time for our first problem session. Now, the problems that I'm going to do are meant to illustrate some of the points that we've made. They're meant to extend you a little bit further, maybe, uh, in some areas that I didn't have time to include in the lecture and then to give you practice at some of the calculations. I'm going to start off with problem one that's going to be a full boundary value problem solution. So you see how a solution could go from start to finish with these little rod elements. I call this solution of a rod assembly. And what I've done is taken two line elements here, two rod elements, and pinned them together, and then pinned them at the left end to ground. I've put a live load of 1,000 newtons on the right end and no load in the interior. And the question is to find the displacements in the rod assembly. I could also have asked for the forces and the stresses and some other things. It is statically determinate, and you could see that that 1,000 newtons will carry through the structure and react at the left end. But let's not assume that. Let's get that out as an ant part of the answer. In fact, you should be able to solve such a problem thoroughly by our stiffness ideas. This would be called a mixed boundary value problem inasmuch as we have a displacement condition on the left end and a force condition on the right end. Now the intermediate node, number two, because it has zero force on it, that still is a force boundary condition. It's not a displacement boundary condition. And the interesting thing is that we should be able to tell from the statement of the problem either the force or the displacement at every degree of freedom in the problem. Some people find that surprising at first. It makes it a little different than a conventional classical boundary value problem where many times you're only required to specify information around the boundary of the problem. 
Our problem here, though, requires that we say one or the other about the force light quantity or the, the displacement light quantity at every degree of freedom throughout the whole problem on the boundary and the interior. So let's go into our solution now. Down below, I have taken the numerical values of these physical coefficients that we've been given for stiffness, and I've entered them and already have assembled the stiffness of the left element together with the stiffness of the right element. They overlap at the interior position, and you'll see that that is 3 times 10 to the fourth, which is just the sum of these two separate stiffnesses. Then on the degrees of freedom, we use the assembly degrees of freedom, U1, U2, U3. Uh, of course, the one at the left has been constrained to zero, so that's our displacement boundary condition. Then on the right, we have the 1,000 Newton load, which is known, a force condition, and we know that there are zero units of force in the interior. So I have left the unknowns in red here to show that we need to solve for those quantities. Now, it's always true that when you have displacement conditions in a problem, you've then already specified the field variable at that point. And this will, in effect, reduce the size of the problem because that can be exploited particularly when you set a displacement to be zero, that equation becomes relatively easy to separate out and solve as a separate final step. In our case, I'll do this slowly and show how that can happen. Once you see this, you'll understand how that works. The fact that there's a zero in this first displacement position means that you have eliminated the first column of that matrix because when you post multiply by a matrix, each of those terms affects the matrix here column-wise. So I know that this zero will knock out all of these terms in the first column. Knock them out, I mean uh, cause them to be zero when you multiply by zero. You could, at that point, deflate this equation and, and this set of equations by shrinking this to three rows times two columns and pulling out the zero up there and making it a two vector, uh, but thereby leaving a three vector on the right-hand side. Now, matrix multiplication tends to sum over the nearby indices and will effectively eliminate the um, index that ranges from 1 to 2. Now, of course, that's the column index in the first matrix, and it's the row index in the second. Now, we can do something further. We really have three equations and two unknowns. So we may take the first equation and set it aside. It has been the equation that is largely um, meant to describe u1, but that was set to be 0, and so we'll pull that equation aside, and it becomes merely f1 is a constant times u2. This could be solved later if needed or can be ignored. Notice that f1 is a reaction in the system. So in other words, when you apply the live loads on over here, you're able to set aside the equations for which you would find the reactions here, and those can be solved at the end if you wish. Many computer codes will ask the user, do you want to find the reactions? Sometimes they're called constraint forces in the problem. And if you don't ask for it, you won't get it because it's a separate step. Now we're left with a two-by-two two set of equations shown here, and this is a solvable set of equations. I know physically that we've removed the rigid body mode because we've pinned the left end, and therefore that pair of rods cannot translate along their own axis. They're constrained in space. Another way to look at that is to look at the determinant of this equation, and you'll find that it is positive. It's six minus 4, which is 2. So you are guaranteed to find an equation solution. 
Now the solution of a two by two set of equations isn't real glorious and I won't labor on it long. We'll just use conventional high school elimination of variables where you add equations and subtract and uh, work with the coefficients. In this case we add the two co equations and that directly gives the displacement at the center node. Then you could go back into the first equation say and find the deflection at the right node. And that ratio then is in the ratio of 0.15 millimeters to 0.1 millimeters. Uh, not being evenly divided because the rightmost rod is stiffer. That really solves the problem and I put the little check mark here to indicate how self-satisfied we all are right now. But if we wanted to go back and get the force of constraint, we could use that equation that we temporarily set aside, and we would find that it is minus 1,000 newtons. And that completes the problem, bringing us all three of the unknown quantities that we did not know at the start. And I sketched those all in the diagram here below. Now, when I teach, it's often a burden to try to keep the student from guessing an answer and putting it into the set of original equations. And this gets things all scrambled up. So for instance, many people will look at this problem and say, well, I saw that that load at the left end was minus 1,000 newtons. And they'll put that into the equation. And before long, things get tangled up. And you've got either too many or too few equations, and uh, typically too many. And so I would say, play this game honestly. Don't guess the answer, because the equations are exactly right to solve for all the unknowns for you. Our second problem has to do with the definition of the stiffness matrix. I'm going to give some physical information and then see if you can infer what the stiffness terms ought to be. This was originally an exam problem and did cause quite a bit of consternation among the students taking the exam. I gave some physical properties of a spring, namely coil diameters and so on, and then I gave some experimental information and asked the students to calculate as many terms in the stiffness matrix as they could. Now, first of all, a lot of people couldn't figure out how to handle a matrix like the, that would correspond to this problem. Notice that there is both a translation and a rotation at each of the two nodes. So there really are four degrees of freedom. Now, many people, when they see this, immediately try to break this into two two-by-two two stiffness matrices. But as you'll see in a minute from the experimental data, there is coupling between the two, such that if you pull on this spring, it will want to unwind, and it will put a an opposing moment on the node. And so, really, of the four degrees of freedom, you must study all four, and you have a four by four matrix with 16 components. The two experiments are simple and are described here. First of all, we propose that the left end is clamped and that displacements are imposed on the right end. Notice that I'm using the blue arrows here for the displacement information and the red arrows here. So these displacements, in the presence of constraints over here, cause these reaction forces. And there is this coupling that um, what we've really done then is imposed a single displacement U3, and then we've recovered these two forces. Now if you think about it, that's directly the definition of some of the stiffness terms, because they are, in fact, the force at a given degree of freedom due to unit displacement at only another degree of freedom. So we, it turns out we have enough information right here for two of the stiffness terms relating to these two degrees of freedom. Uh, likewise, the second experiment uh, is a unit rotation. Now that's a little large, but we'll say it's within the range. The radian measure is a little bit awkward for a problem such as this, but our spring is, uh, maybe it's got a lot of turns and can handle that. And the same thing happens, that you get both a, an opposing force and here a, um, an opposing moment. Now to hold this
displacement U3 zero will require some horizontal force here. So it's not as if this uh, body's not in equilibrium. There are enough forces to do the job. Okay, we're going to assume the spring remains linear, even under that one radian uh, rotation at the end. And the viewer is asked, using elastic symmetry, geometry, and equilibrium concepts, construct the stiffness matrix for this spring. And then a second um, add-on problem is that uh, suppose you had two such springs, how can you assemble them? And that's, that's a relatively easy problem. So let's solve the problem. Our first experiment was the one where we had reaction forces here and the impressed displacements were shown here. We actually were given all four displacements under the statement that the left end was clamped and those reactions were in the presence of no rotation and translation. And remembering that post multiplication by a vector here causes this component, the third component here, to multiply the third column over here. So the first two forces over here are going to allow us to solve for these stiffness terms that are in red, K13 and K23. Literally, K13 is the translational force on degree of freedom 1 due to a unit translation at only degree of freedom 3, and that number was minus 100. So we immediately can solve for that. Likewise with K23 being the moment at 2, due to a unit translation at 3, gives us immediately that quantity. And then I enter that below directly into the stiffness matrix. The second experiment is similar. It's actually a unit rotation in the fourth degree of freedom. We know the reactions at the left end. And again, we're able to directly solve for K14 and K24 getting the numbers minus 50 and minus 100. So right off the bat, from the direct interpretation of those experiments, those experiments were definitely set up to give you stiffness terms directly. To this point, we've actually found four of the 16 coefficients in that matrix. But now let's tinker with the data. We know that when we were given reactions at the left end of that spring, that we can then, through static determinacy, we can find the live loads at the right end that really go along with those enforced displacements. So from equilibrium, we can immediately find what F3 and F4 are. They're the negatives of the quantities on the left end. That, in effect, doubles the power of the experiments because we can now take our first experiment where we imposed a unit translation on the right end and we can say, hey, that was going to take uh, these live loads since, since they have to balance these. Now, in a sense, I'm violating something I said earlier uh, about problems where I didn't want you to guess the answer. But now we've been given really an inadequate amount of information to try to do the task at hand. So I'm, I'm grabbing at any straw that I can. And that will directly give us K3, 3, and K4, 3. These turn out to be positive numbers. And I enter those in the next sequence below. The second experiment for the unit rotation at the right end um, would cause these loads to be generated on the right end in order to balance these, as we saw before, and directly lets you find the next two terms. We've now found eight out of the 16 stiffness coefficients. And I embed those four that were recently found into this matrix. Now, regardless of the shape of the body, there is a reciprocity theorem. It really has to do with symmetry of the elastic stiffness matrix. Some people call it the Raleigh, Betty, Maxwell reciprocity theorem, and so on. But what it means is that Kij has to equal Kji. And that immediately tells you for our body, regardless of its shape, as long as it's an elastic material, would have to have the 
off-diagonal terms in the lower left equal to the off-diagonal terms in the upper right. And that gives us another four entries immediately. That was pretty easy, and that's basically a material symmetry. It has to do with conservation of energy. You can prove that Kijs equals Kji if you take two loads and apply them in one order and then remove them in the opposite order, and then you check out the energy that is released upon removal and make sure that it's the same as energy stored, and you always find that Kij has to equal, equal Kji. All right, the last point is really pretty subtle, and I can understand why people couldn't get the final four terms in this matrix. Uh, a simple way would be to walk around to the other side of the springs and then just use a different numbering on the uh, nodes and say that by geometric symmetry, whatever happened on that one when the body was facing one direction should happen in a mirror image facing the other. This is a kind of a geometric symmetry about the uh, center of the body. Uh, another way to think of it is that the system should be invariant, the forces should be invariant. That means they shouldn't change under a rigid body translation. So I'm going to use that second idea, namely Rather than moving the right end a given distance and holding the left end fixed, what if you proposed uh, this second situation here where you move the left end a unit to the left and held the right end fixed? Now that's a um, kind of a mirror image problem to the one over here that we were originally given. And my claim is that the forces should be the same in those two problems. And then a way to rationalize that is their only difference is a rigid body translation of one millimeter. It's the body is under the same forces and, and uh, deflections other than that. And if you do that, then that's effectively a minus one translation on the left end that produces the same forces as previously you got from a plus one translation here at the right end. And that will directly let us find K11 and K1 and K21 shown here and here. And finally, we can do another mirror image problem like that. So I'll propose a similar experiment in regard to the rotary uh, displacement. <clears throat> Here's my mythical experiment in which I fix the right end and I have a minus one radian rotation at the left end. That should cause the same forces and moments as the original experiment did, with the only difference being a one radian rigid body motion different in the two. And when you do that, you immediately pick up K12 and K22, which finishes the entire stiffness matrix. I think many people when they first see this problem are a little mystified as to how you could get more than four of the components and here in fact we've gone ahead and gotten all 16. The add-on problem, part B, had to do with assembling two of those springs in parallel and of course that assembly is very similar to our addition of the two rod elements, except this time we have rotary degrees of freedom in addition to translational. So here we join, and this time we're going to get an overlap in these center two degrees of freedom. So effectively we are overlapping two four by four matrices this time, and they both add stiffness to the center two coordinates. And if the on-diagonal terms were 100 units each, then the sum of two of them is 200 units. And it happened to be the same for both rotation and translational effects. On the off-diagonal, we had 50 units and from each of the uh, contributing pairs, and so we end up with 100 on these uh, off-diagonal terms. So not too hard, really, to assemble two such elements. Make sure you understand this. Make sure that you know that you couldn't break this down into a two-by-two two problem because it doesn't uncouple.
Problem three is a more difficult assembly problem in two ways. One is that I'm going to assemble different elements that are connected in a more complicated way. And secondly, because we're in two dimensions now, I'm going to make use of a shorthand notation called compact notation. It turns out that the connectivity in assemblies really depends on the nodal numbering. The reason is that the degrees of freedom, whether there's one or six at a node, all have the same connectivity with other nodes. They're either all connected or there are none of them connected. This is because the little individual stiffness matrix is typically full and all the degrees of freedom at one node affect all the degrees of freedom at another node. As a result, you can exploit that simplification and only keep track of the connectivity between the node numbers. So here you see we have a triangle on the left denoted by alpha. And alpha then will connect nodes 1, 2, and 3. And I show that, and you can block that out here, basically. In fact, of course, each of these little alpha symbols stands for a little 2 by 2 matrix, if you want to think in that term. That would be the compact way of, uh, sorry, that would be the detailed way of thinking of the uh, variables. But we're not doing that. We're doing compact. The other triangle called beta contributes beta, beta, beta over here between 4, 5, and 6, and adds this little block of symbols in red. The upper rod, gamma, um, is in the blue color, and it connects nodes 2 and 5, and that's a little more widespread. You have to put in K22, K25, here's K52 and K55. Whereas delta down below connects 3 and 4, which is, again, pretty compact. And so these terms all connect together. And again, we have some bandedness here that there's a uh, set of zeros that lie outward of these diagonal lines. Our fourth problem is not a standard problem in finite element technology. I'm going to get an exact solution to a tapered rod, and the exact answer will come out logarithmic. Now, we usually don't use transcendental functions for interpolating the field variables, but uh, we will follow this one as an exact solution. If I have this tapered element here with an area that's changing from some baseline value A0 at the left end to some quantity B times that at the right end. It's really 1 plus B. Uh, then, for instance, if B were unity, this would double in size from the left to the right end. And let's use an equilibrium equation. And if we find the exact solution, we'll find it will not be a polynomial. Now, there's some trickery involved here. We don't have our full power up yet for our energy methods, so um, don't be dismayed by the solution procedure here. It is a little tricky. The one thing we would know about this element is that at the right end, there would be a force F2. And if I made a, a cut in the interior of the body and looked at a small free body diagram of the right end, I would get that the stress in the interior would have to be that force over the total rod area. Now, involving these um, x terms here, you see. So we already have the internal stress evaluated in terms of the force at the right end. Now we can use Hooke's law to get the internal strain merely by taking the stress over the Young's modulus. And that just adds this E factor in here. Now, strain in the engineering strain is just du dx. And the fundamental theorem of calculus is that if you know what the derivative of function is, then you can get the function by integrating. And you'll cough up a integration constant here, which will figure out that if we integrate from the left end to some intermediate position, then the, we have to account for the deflection at the left end, which is merely the deflection of the left coordinate. So, um, if the body has moved a bit on the left, then that's our, that is the quantity U1.
in any event, we evaluate this integral. We know what the strain is. We just found it up above, put that in. You can integrate that directly, adding this constant of integration, and you end up with a logarithmic function. I think at this point, it, it's kind of a strange problem yet, but if you see what we've done, though, we really have found the internal displacement field now as a function of things that are happening on the end of the body, and so we're certainly getting it over to a discrete form. Perhaps the strongest trick here now is to evaluate the displacement field at the right end. We tied in what happened at the left end because of a constant of integration, but now let's use this trick. If we take that field displacement and we know that that's identically u2 when we evaluate it at the right node, then we just put that value in and the x over l term becomes unity and you get this. Now, what you've got now is even more strong than before because now we have the force at the end related to the displacements at the ends. So we solve for the force and we get this equation. But by equilibrium, because this is a statically determinate structure, we can just say that F1 has to be minus F2. We saw that for the line element earlier, the uh, rod element. And all that is is a change in sign. Now, if you think about it, we're back to that position we were before where you have two unknowns on the left side and you look at the two equations and you find that on the right side you have the two unknowns, but sprinkled among the coefficients. So just by collecting terms and putting the u1 and u2 in a little more careful term on the right side here, you're going to find that this is exactly the matrix relation and will give you this stiffness, that you have this leading constant here plus this symmetric set of terms that show the input-output relation of the force. Now, the reason that I've done this little problem is because this exact answer is helpful a little bit later in evaluating some of the approximate methods when you might attack this same tapered element. Problem five is just a discussion of the displacement fields and the way that we interpolate the internal displacement in a finite element. For our two-noted line element or rod element, a person could define this field displacement as a constant term and then a linear term, and we could call that a displacement function. We're going to do quite a bit of work a little later on our energy methods with what are called shape functions, and that's where you relate the field displacement to what's happening at the nodes. Now that takes this pair of functions here, which are interpolation functions. We'll talk a lot about those later. One thing that I just thought I would have you look at, though, is whether there's a relation between these two ideas. and Notice that this is just a um, straight mathematical polynomial form, but there's something physical here. You're trying to take the nodal displacements and multiply times a known function. Now, in both cases, you've got basically two unknowns. Here you have generalized coordinates q1 and q2 that characterize the field displacement. Here you have nodal coordinates u1 and u2 that characterize the displacement field. Are those related in any way? Well, it turns out, yes, they are, because if you evaluate at the left end, let's say, if you take the uh, first equation for the displacement function, you'll find that u1 is q1, and there is no uh, function of x there, and then q2 would be times 0, so that would drop out, and you get immediately that q1 was u1. In other words, in this polynomial form, this displacement function, you can identify that the first generalized coordinate is going to be the displacement of the left end of the rod. Now, we stumbled on that actually in our tapered rod, too, but that's, a, that's just a coincidence. That's no big deal. Now, the other thing you can do is evaluate at the right end, 
you take the displacement polynomial again with the L for the X dependence, set that equal to U2, and uh, then you can relate what Q2 is in terms of the displacements at the ends. And really all I wanted to show here is that these two approaches are complementary. They say things in a little different way, but they're interchangeable. And so start thinking about what it means to have an interior displacement field, and then how can you characterize that either by a set of polynomials with generalized coordinates or by using the nodal displacement somehow to tame the situation and, and give um, the sizing to the displacement field. I thought it would be a good idea to ask a consulting engineer, Bob Schmitz from Automated Analysis, to say a few words about the use of rod in his consulting practice. Now, I've only used the rod element in a bolt situation, and I used it to pre-tension the cap on a connecting rod, but I know there must be wider usage of the rod element than that. I've used the, the rod element to model a bolt as well, but I've also used it to model radial stiffness in a pin connection. If you have a spider connection modeling a pin, uh, you can model it rigid and lose the stiffness to the flexibility, but I've used the rod element to account for the flexibility by providing some, some area to give it some stiffness that's different than the rigid connection.